Welcome back to another episode of the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast. My name is Solomon Parker. In this episode of the podcast, I have a special guest for you, as usual. Uh, this episode, I have a guy named Greg, Greg V, on the forum, if you want to find him. We'll be talking about a little bit of uh, his stuff, pictures that he's posted on the Treatment Free Beekeepers Forum at forum.tfbees.net, if you want to go check that out while you're listening. If not, Don't worry, we'll just listen. He's got some interesting stuff to say about his experience with Lance hives and how he adapts Langstroth frames to his Lance hive design, which is a little bit different than uh, than the original from Leo Shereshkin. So uh, sit back or drive or walk or whatever you do when you listen to podcasts, and let's talk to Greg. Greg, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Hello, Solomon. Well, as usual, let's get started by telling us how you got into beekeeping. Um, okay, so beekeeping. Um, this is my second stint into beekeeping. Um, so the second time now, this is my year two, probably into third year now. But prior to that, I spent about 10 years or so uh, on a bee yard being my dad's smoke boy. Um, so I was a beekeeping. Um, I was a assistant, you know, doing smoking, cleaning, whatever, uh, for my dad since I was about seven. So, um, and until about 16 or so, and then I kind of, uh, my dad passed. I went to college. Uh, my mom sold the bees, and that was the rest of the story. I mean, you know, it was done. Um, so, Life kind of happened, and so um, I was born in Russia, by the way, and so um, that's what my accent is about. Um, and so I've been living in the U.S. for like 25 years. Um, I'm just regular suburban dweller. <laughs> um, I'm um, sort of a sustainability freak uh, in terms of uh, I garden, I grow my own food. Um, I try to be sustainable, you know, um, it's a little bit different talk, I'm not going to get into it much, but, uh, um, I knew about beekeeping, well, I know about beekeeping a lot, but, um, I never cared to do it on my own again, because basically, number one, I knew that, uh, basically to have your bees nowadays, you have to be kind of <sighs> using chemicals. And so, and I don't do any chemicals in my food, um, so I didn't really care about it too much. And um, that was number one. And number two, you know, liabilities, I didn't really care about bees in my backyard, just in case somebody gets stung, whatever. But um, a couple of years ago now, I was looking into a, uh, maybe buying a piece of land so I can start doing my um, orchard projects to grow more trees and stuff like that. Well, I didn't because it's just too expensive for me, it turns out to be. And I'm in Dane County, Wisconsin, uh, so it's kind of pricey here. Um, so along the way, as I was researching all this, um, I stumbled onto website of Leo Shurashki. <laughs> Pure accident. So I read that, and I said, okay, that sounds familiar. And so I decided to go ahead and go to local beekeeping club just once, just to see what people are about. And so as they were discussing this and that, I thought, I know all of this. <laughs> There's nothing to talk about. But uh, but then I stumbled into um, the Joe Bissetti. And you know him, Solomon, right? Yes, I do know him. Yeah. <laughs> so it turns out I live like 20 minutes from him, 20, 25 minutes from him. And his job is like five minutes from my house. <laughs> anyway, so I joined our local on the Big Pin Forum, and I was starting kind of reading just in the waters. It turns out, and um, you don't need to be doing chemicals to keep bees. Um, according to what I found out by then, it was two years ago now. So I thought, well, here I am. I have the tools. Uh, I mean, um, I partially built my house. 
I have garage full of lumber. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so I said, you know what? Let me build a hive or two or three. And let me build a couple, three f- traps. I have no bees. I have no desire to pay any money for bees. I have no money for it either. But I have plenty of free lumber. And bees supposed to be free if you catch them. And so, and two years ago, I got my first swarm. Um, like at the end of August. <laughs> and so, you know, so my old sense was, well, basically, whatever you catch in the end of summer, it's not worth anything. Well, it's all the same. But today, sugar is cheap. So I got the swarm. I got a second one. So I had two swarms at the 27th of August here in Wisconsin. What do I do? Well, I feed them. I give them dry sugar, according to your advice and some others out there. And I pull at least one of them through the winter. So by the next spring, I had a beehive. So what do I do next? Well, the expansion model thing, you know. Um, I expand them and I catch more swarms. And um, I meet some people on treatment-free forums. So um, this is fellow. He goes by nickname Nordic. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Burns, right? You know him. Okay. Great guy. So um, he goes, hey, Greg, uh, would you like a few queens from me? Because I need to do something. And I said, Sure, I'll take a few queens from you. <laughs> and so I got a few queens from him. And so by the end of next summer, I had 12 hives. Uh, for the cost of shipping of four queens, I guess. That was my only expense. Well, I had to buy a smoker and a beekeeping jacket. That's my expense. That's it. And I have 12 beehives. Um, and it was last fall. So today, right now, I have three remaining survivors, and we can talk about details later, uh, but basically, this is where I am. So um, I'm not on Facebook. I just don't participate in Facebook. Um, I'm an IT person, and I'm a little bit skittish about my personal security, I mean, you know, privacy, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's my thing. It's my thing. I'm a, I'm a security database professional by, by, by trade. So that kind of keeps me away from Facebook a little bit. <laughs> but, I understand. Um, yeah. But, um, but the beekeeping forums, I uh, feel, give me enough privacy. So I'm not worried about that too much. So I'm pretty active then here a little bit. So uh, people probably know me. Um, so that's where I am right now. <laughs> Well, great, and I love um, teaching people how to keep bees with a minimum amount of money. So why don't you talk about um, how you built your hives? Did you go with the Lands Hive? Um, so, Solomon, uh, yeah, oh man, I, I love bee hive building. That's partially why I started doing this. Um, I partially finished my own house, uh, basement, uh, porch. My dad was a house builder. So I'm kind of, I'm little, I mean, he was big. I'm just kind of like, eh. But, um, so yes, um, I, I stumbled upon Leo Shurashkin website. So I read it A to Z. And he has great plans, like great plans. Um, so I really like his lands, Hive, for a number of reasons. Be- number one, um, I'm on, I live in zone 5A and sometimes it's, Zone four, depending of season, every year is different. So this year is like almost f- feels like four. I mean, the zone four, it's pretty cold. Uh, today, my kids were snowed out of school. By the way, so we had no school due to the snow. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You have lots of snow. You'll go skiing after this. Um, but one of the issues with lands. Behind immediately that I envisioned. I'm, um, um, you know, I, I'm about standards myself. Uh, quite a bit. I mean, you know, um, I'm an IT person. I have to deal with data standards, uh, where data from one vendor 
plugs into a system of some other vendor. And often enough, you have issues when data don't fit, and that's a big problem. Well, um, so in terms of beekeeping, bee frame sizes and measurements is what you're talking about. So lands, um, I just hated the idea of being non-standard. But everything else I really like because I, I grew with the dance. Uh, my dad was running a classic 12 frame the dance and 12 frame and 14 frames. Um, and I saw benefit of those, but then again, I, I, the idea of being non-standard is kind of really uh, rubs me wrong way because immediately Solomon, you can see issues, you know, say I, I, if I decide to buy the extractor someday, maybe I will, maybe I don't, but I really would like to be compatible to standard extractors so I don't have to pay uh, too much money for an extractor because it's non, non-standard. That's one example, right? Um, secondly, say one day I need to sell a nuke or I will buy a nuke or whatever. I'd like to be compatible with people around me, at least somewhat. So the, my frame should be similar to people's frames around me. And so what I did, I, I took um, the, somebody gave me a few frames. I mean, I already had frames from, um, I had medium Langstroth. I took two of those. I turned them at 90 degrees. I took a few Ziplocs. I tied them together, and that's my frame. So my frame, my basic frame is, um, the, I build hives similar to layers, but my frame is not his size. And my frame is a uh, size of compatible to um, length strokes. Um, and I also now work with, um, I have new designs in the work, but basically um, thinking about also reusing a standard deep length stroke. I just turn it sideways, so it's kind of deep. Mm-hmm. Because overall, um, I like the idea of being horizontal. So my highs are horizontal. Uh, for a number of reasons, um, I don't know, three, four years now. Well, anyway, back when I was a college student, I, I, I worked in the warehouse. So I understand how important my back is <laughs> uh, and my shoulder. My right shoulder is kind of bad as well. Um, so about three or four years ago, I was doing my potato planting and I injured my back. So it took me about a couple of months to recover my back. And I also injured my shoulder again. So that took me about a month to recover my shoulder. And so pretty soon I, I understood that ergonomics of the beekeeping is important to me. Um, in that, um, see, when you, Solomon, I mean, you know, and you've done it many times yourself. I heard your talks. Um, you, if you're in length strength model, you work with dips. You kind of prefer to work with blocks of frames. You know, that's kind of the beauty of the length, commercial length system, I'd say. Um, but then, I mean, you basically just move boxes like by 10, by 10, by 10, run, you, bear, you, you can be very efficient in that. Uh, the issue being is, you have to watch yourself because in the heat of a moment, it's really easy to turn around, have 40 pounds of weight in your back, in your arms, um, and you can easily injure yourself. I mean, it happened to me when I was in the White House. So, so like, therefore, I, for me, from uh, uh, well, being kind of conscious about these issues, I, I, I'm pursuing horizontal model. And that's where my system kind of comes in. I'm trying to um, be, I kind of insist for me anyway, that way. But I also, at the same time, I want to be compatible to typical beekeepers around me for, I mean, reasons already stated. So, um, well, so anyway, I mean, I can talk, but <laughs> I think I kind of gave you an idea, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, oh yeah, one other moment. Um, I did look into Top Bar beehives um and again i was attracted by the cost of it i mean i'm cheap right you know and i'm cheap and proud of it if you will (laughs) because i mean you know to be honest i mean so much wood around here i'm in wisconsin and i'm a new development here and then there's construction dumps everywhere and typical wood is everywhere it's two by four and two by six i mean they're just all over the place and in addition to it uh commercial grade plywood it's free. 
I mean, you ask for, people, put it out there. You just drive in the neighborhood. You pick up stuff. It basically, uh, if you're handy with table saw, there's no need to buy anything at all. Uh, well, screws and nails, I suppose. Um, so, and top bar that way is really attractive to me. However, uh, issue with top bar, uh, where I'm at, is it's not really energy efficient. Um, um, when I was kind of improving my own house, I spent days and hours, weeks, uh, researching energy efficiency. And um, one of the fundamentals of energy efficiency is this. Um, you want your volume. I'm talking about housing right now. You want your volume ratio to the surface to be minimal. For an example, the most uh, standard building structure is cube, ideal cube. That's the most energy efficient structure in that you have the least possible surface to the most possible volume. Okay, And so top bar that way is not really efficient at all. It is long and sort of skinny and shallow. And so you have, for the amount of surface you have, you have very little volume in it meaning that bees have to, in cold climate, especially like here, bees have to expend much more energy just to kind of um, keep alive. So, therefore, uh, my challenge was I would like to be horizontal in design, and at the same time, I would like to approach the cube shape as, as close as possible. And so, therefore, you know, the solution is kind of like, well, it's a bicycle. There's nothing new here. It's standard, uh, traditional, all European horizontal hive. That's what Leo does, except he has lens. And I do, I call it Ukrainian hive because my frame is almost ideally, uh, almost identical to the Ukrainian frame, which is the Dant frame, joint 90 degrees. So, anyway, that's this part <laughs> so um i think i'm done talking for now about hives but yeah unless you have questions sure how uh you talk about turning the frame sideways how does that mm -hmm. work do you have to make a different like like how does that work do you use just regular frames sideways how do they how do they stay in the hive are they you know how does that work okay um oh by the way i have um pictures uh that I posted on your TF forum site. I have threads there um, about trapping and also about hives, including pictures. Okay. So you can even look up because I know you're a visual thinker. Yes, I am. Uh, yes. Um, so the pictures are there. But basically, um, I take a um, saw. I just zap, zap those little um, you know, uh, ears of the Langstroth and I screw my own top bar. Okay. And so basically you have vertically turned length strokes on the the frames. The ears are sort of and then I have my own top bar screwed on top of them perpendicular. Okay. Uh, you know, and that that's it right there. Um and then um if you find pictures on that form, um you can Google up right now. Um um you see exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, so basically um I'm building my own frames as well, um, mm -hmm. but like last year, I was so behind on everything. Bees were coming at me. I was catching swarms. I had three swarms in my traps. I was catching swarms uh, by the beekeeping forum here. I would just go into a call and pick up a swarm, and I had no hives. <laughs> so I was behind. I was like putting bees into... I kept in the cardboard boxes, as a matter of fact. Um, I... I have many computer boxes. I kept in computer boxes. Uh, yep, just like that. Um, until they grew out of them. So, and so that was kind of experience there. Um, but yeah, um, so I have plans to build more frames when I have time for it. But um, I'm being um, the I bought on the, for a really really cheap big pile of plastic on um, the. Length fox high, um, the frames from some beekeeper here, and I reuse them. I mean, you know, when I'm I have no time, I just take them, quickly cut them, you know, time together, frames ready, and that's what I do. 
and when I have time or I, my um, the high school kid has time, uh, I just kind of like we build few frames, more or less properly. But who has the time nowadays? <laughs> so, uh, yep. Well, great. Well, I'm looking at the pictures right now. If you want to, as you're listening, if you're close to a computer, if you go to forum.tfbs.net slash view topic dot php question mark t equals 890. And you can see pictures of your hives and the frames turned sideways. And it's very interesting. Yeah, um, I think... I even yeah I am have a topic I call it rant about Lance Hive. <laughs> yeah, rant about Lance Hive is what it's called. Yeah, right there. Uh, because like I said, I really like Leo's uh, Leo's hives. Except the issue of not being non standard is like ah, it just you know it doesn't work really well for me. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I after some head scratching I thought well I mean it's it's really a non issue. <laughs> So. Have you thought about building the frames like his and just, well, I don't know. I have, I have different thoughts about it because like if you, if your, if your concern is a, an extractor, um, rather than buying an extractor, you might build an extractor since you're the type of building person. Um, I could. Yeah. Um, um, but okay. Here's the deal. Um, um, I really like Michael Bush, um, and I read his site uh, extensively. And what I like about Michael Bush, um, he basically said, you know, he kept 20, he kept bees for twenty six years and he had an extractor. And I thought, you know, he's my type of a guy. <laughs> um, that way, um, because as a matter of fact, you know, um, you don't have to have one. And so uh, until you kind of get, well, anyway. I mean, you can just crush. And um, I am foundationless. And um, again, number one, I don't have to buy anything. And number two, um, I'm trying to regress whatever I buy, um, whatever bees I catch. Uh, I, I try to regress them to whatever cell size they want to have. And so one way to do it, obviously, I'm the foundationless. And... Um, what happens there, Solomon, is um, the, like, right now, um, so out of 12 hives I, I had in, 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 the, in the August, I have three left, okay? The rest of them died. Um, and I have lots and lots of frames right now with honey and combs. And I know that about 50, 50% of those combs need to be basically called because they are non-standard and either honeycombs or um, drone combs. So, well, and most of them are full of honey, by the way. So what am I to do? I will go through all the frames. I basically select good um, the, the, uh, brood size the combs. I will leave them for next year because I need to recycle them for uh, my next season. And whatever is non-standard, uh, just honey, just drones, or uh, whatever, I will crash them all. And so basically, I'll purge some of the combs I don't really want to have around. Um, so, and um, it, it's kind of like, well, you know, I don't need to have extractor for that. So that's kind of my plan for the now. So, um, and, and, but and secondly, again, um, if you saw a picture, I'm looking at a picture of this um, frame, which is two medium frames strapped together. Um, if I'm lucky enough one day, maybe sell a nuke or two or three, um, I would like, and people around me, for the most part, they will be on Langstroth system. So I should be able to just basically build a nuke for them using the standard sizing. You know, I can just disassemble the frame. Or I also, I'm thinking about designs where I actually do use frames as is, but I prefer them turned. And so basically, you know, I can just hang them at 90 degrees. Mm-hmm. Just screw top bars on top of them. And um, all it is to it, basically. Um in addition, um, um, I have nukes that will take uh, length of equipment frames to be 
technical um, at 90 degrees, uh, so they will they will take um, the dips and they will take mediums, and those are good for the nook size hives. So you know I can take about eight to nine dips. Imagine a, a typical dip box. You just flip it on its sides, and that's your hive. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Basically, that's how I do it. But make it longer. Um, yeah, yeah, and you can do that. Um, um, so yeah, uh, and by the way, so the Langstroth deep frame is almost identical, if it's not identical, in sizing to all traditional Polish frame, uh, in size called Levitsky frame. So the poles, you, I'm not sure if they still do it, but well, some people do, I know for the fact. Uh, they run horizontal hives uh, in that system, and basically the frames, are those length strokes frames turn 90 degrees. That's what they are. So, um, I mean, you know, it works great. And they report excellent wintering uh, for more or less cold um, the, the locations, I guess. So That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, one of the reasons, um, I thought about it for a while. Um, um and I mean, I, I thought of motivation of going frames wide and shallow, uh, typical Ledant or Langstroth, and I can totally understand practical application of that frame. If you're running many, many, many hives uh, and commercial settings, it makes total sense to do it this way mm-hmm. because it makes it for more efficiency. Um, however, if you win... Um, my setting, I'm sort of a homesteader, sort of a peasant, if you will. You know. I envision to have 10 to 20 hives. Uh, it's more than that, it becomes too much work for me uh, because I have a job just like you do. Uh, but then you, you cannot drop less than that, fewer than that either, because then it becomes, well, can you survive a winter on three hives? <laughs> Maybe not. So 10 to 20 hives is a good number, um, but uh, I'm not commercial. So I don't need to be really really efficient because i don't need to, i i don't deal with hundreds of hives per day you know and um so that's one consideration and number two bees do winter in the vertical setting better uh in the remember my talk about efficiency so when you have this shallow and wide the takes more effort <clears throat> from energy standpoint for bees to condition their space um, both ways to cool it down and to to um, to keep the cluster warm enough it takes more energy um, so when you have this kind of vertical vertically oriented that way um, it is um, preferable but I mean there's many papers by now so you know, I'm not gonna talk for the scientists mm-hmm. they can talk <laughs> so, oh, by the way, uh, just last night I was listening to um, the, the YouTube. I'm, I'm watching the YouTube about uh, beekeeping in Russia right now, about this um, uh, Russian bees, whatever. Um, and there's a good number for you. Um, so, about energy efficiency of the bees. Um, it is typical in, in those localities, at Zone 3, by the way. It's Zone 3 of USA. Um Typical Russian cluster requires for the winter about 15 to 20 pounds of honey. 15, 20 pounds of honey. Really? Yes. That's what I'm trying to cross, to get across to a few people and nobody believes me. But I'm saying, guys, the current system here in US, people talking about 50 to 60 to 80 pounds of honey for the winter. I mean, you know, like... <sighs> I know you can substitute this sugar, but what it tells you is that uh, it's not efficient in many, many ways. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be that way. So, um, so we're here. We're really working with like those warmer climate European bees, whereas the Russian bees are much more efficient. Uh, that is one component. And second component is equipment setup as well, uh, because um, the those kind of older style uh, hives like Polish Ukrainians, they are actually more efficient that way. 
and the way they set up them for the winter is more efficient. Uh, clearly, those are not really good. Those those hives are not they're not good for um, the um, how should I say it? for commercial setup, for big scale setup, uh, and for mobile beekeeping. So yeah, the the, the issue there. So um, what I'm building in my hives, uh, my one of my requirements was immediately up front. Um, I have a minivan, and I have this transporter that I plug into port, and so I must be able to pull, move my hives because my backyard. I I am typical suburban dweller. My 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 property is nine thousand square feet, right? <laughs> so there's so many bees I can fit in my backyard. Um, so before I, I even started, like two years ago now, I immediately started scouting around the locations where I could set up my bees. And so today, right now, I have four different bee, um, bee yards. Because, I mean, if you are more or less serious about it, you need to be able to have secondary remote bee yards for a number of reasons. Um, so I have four. And I, I must be able to move my beehives. So my beehive fit into standard uh, luggage carrier perfectly because that's how I build them. And this frame size, by the way, is conveniently fits. So everything kind of fits very nicely. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I move my beehives because of a um, number of reasons, you know. Um, so, but, but, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's a requirement. And so um, that way. So, but I'm not commercial because, you know, I have a job. So, um, so basically that's where I'm coming from. I should say. Great. Uh, looking at one, a couple of these pictures, it says that you, or when you have a, an experiment that the walls are made from sandwiched plywood and rigid foam. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how you built that? Oh yeah. Um, so, um, as you found out, probably, uh, so my hives, are, uh, just like Leo's hives, uh, from uh, two by lumber is because it's free, right? One buy is harder to find. I'm not, I'm not sure why, but two buy is just everywhere. It's because it's just plentiful and cheap. And so that's what I use. That makes hides a little bit on the heavy side. And so, but immediately by design, my hides kind of, you set it up and don't move it anymore. But when you move it, it's two person's job. I'm not going to move high by myself. It's not a good idea. But so I have handles, I plug it in, it's for two easy, for two persons, it's really easy to do. Um, so I thought, okay, let me experiment a little bit and see if I can make it a little bit lighter. So the last hive I built was, um, I take, oh yeah, I found a piece of plywood on the street. Somebody just set him out. So I took it. It's a, I, th I think it was about um, half inch thick. No, it was about three eighths, something like that. So plywood, and then I have plenty of uh rigid foam from some dumpster. So rigid foam and then another plywood thing. And basically um, that's your sandwich. And of course, all the way around, they're like strips of wood. So this, the, the foam is not exposed. Um, in the end, it's maybe a little bit lighter. Uh, I, you know, it's a good question. So I need to measure them. I have a couple of hives close by here. I need to actually try to measure them in, I don't know, when it gets warmer, maybe a little bit, to see what how they compare. But not much. Unfortunately, not much because this construction plywood is kind of heavy. Um, it really is heavy. So it's kind of dense. So maybe... I don't know. I'm, it's kind of marginal difference, I should say. But it is maybe, maybe, maybe it well, not maybe for the fact it is better insulated because of a uh, rigid foam has much higher R value. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, and I have other ideas. Uh, next, next spring, I, I, I want to build a hive, and instead of, um, I want to build it, I want to fill it with straw, not, not straw, um, cat tails. Whatever, I mean, there's nearby over here. There's some kind of pond. Mm -hmm. I'll go cut some kittels down, number one. And number two, uh, inside of the hive, 
I want to leave it exposed. I'll just use um, the uh, number two screen. I just staple it every, every way. In the, I will staple it. And so inside all the cat tail and whatever, whatever stuff, it's going to be just exposed to the bees. And it'll be um, the, the, the number two screen will be just kind of, it will hold the material inside. Um, because I mean, all time people used to make uh, hides from straw. And I mean, all you had the straw. It was straw all the way in and in. It just it was some frame, and frame was was holding the straw inside somehow. But basically, bees were um, exposed to straw as it is right now. And um, why I'm wanting to try it is because um, one of the sources online um, interestingly talk about how um, beehive in itself is actually ecosystem, right? And be it the tree log or whatever non um, um, what's the word non modern way to keep bees being log whatever I mean you're talking about spiders and you know bugs and pseudoscorpions and what have you um, ants they all kind of live right there alongside with the bees and nobody really understands uh, how well the, the the hive ecosystem kind of balances itself out. So I'd like to try something like this. And then there's a blog from Denmark, I think. They talk about it. They kind of experiment. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to build one just like that because I can, you know, sort of like that. So that's one plan. <laughs> that's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you're saying because um, when I was up in Wisconsin this last year, mm-hmm. Uh, I had several people told me, and this happens almost not everywhere I go, but in a lot of places I go, people will tell me that there just aren't swarms available and that my my recommendation for people to catch swarms and free bees is unrealistic. And um, so obviously your story kind of kind of demonstrates against that idea. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, um, yeah, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, um, so, it is not clear cut, and here's why. Um, my first year, I set out there few brand new traps. Oh, yeah, I did all the LGO stuff, and I found I didn't have anything Solomon on hand. I mean, I, I didn't have anything to kind of make it better. So my traps are brand new. I even painted them. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, they were, I, I used Leo Shirashkin's website uh, as a prototype. And, of course, I modified them to fit my frame size a little bit. So I got no bees. And so it was kind of like, ah, uh, okay, fine. But I started late. I put them out there. At, at the end of June, because I just, I was running behind, I, I wasn't sure what to do. Ideally, they should have been out there in May. Anyway, so it was late, number one. Number two, they were brand new from, like, new materials, you know what? Bad idea. Um, and the only way I was able to get bees that season was I actually caught them free-hanging um, by the phone call. Uh, so, um, Last year, last year, things changed a little bit. Uh, number one, um, since I'm kind of a scavenger, it's <laughs> obviously for free stuff, right? Um, so I was able to find, well, I picked up a few beehives, used old beehives. Um, somebody just kept them on their front yard. I stopped by and said, you know, I just beehives. And they said, sure, take them. I said, done, thank you. <laughs> Um, and good deal is they were used before. So um, each one of those used beehives cut me as well. At the exact same places that last year I cut, I cut nothing. So used equipment is really, really beneficial. And, you know, LGO, no LGO, that's fine. But if it's been used, chances increase, number one. Number two... Um, Consideration. Um, what I was gonna say. 
Yeah, um, it is interesting that um, the, oh yeah, well number two, here's the bomb. Uh, this year, I caught worms right in the middle of my active beehive and um, the beehives. So, active beehives, one of the best lures out there. It's like occurred to me as I was doing it, and said, you know what? I, this year, I, I deployed about 15, 15 or so uh, traps. Uh, out of those 15 traps, I got three swarms. And every swarm was basically uh, pretty close or almost next to my active hive. Really? Yes. So, the conclusion is this. Um, I mean, you can put them randomly. Uh, obviously, and chances are you might catch something uh, because you don't know what's going on in the area, right? Like, like um, I really like Jason Brown's talk about, he says, when you just start, kind of just do a wide netting because you don't really know what's going on in your area, right? That's exactly what I've done last year. Um, and also, Joe and I did some experimentation. I mean, I, I tried to collaborate with Joe, and um, um, we even put... Uh, few traps together in some places um, trying to see if the catching the bees, they would prefer his design or my design. Well, it didn't work out. We got nothing there. <laughs> but it was kind of like, you know, totally unknown. Place looks good. There could be feral bees here, but how do we know? We set up a trap, you know, got nothing. On the other hand, um, um, I have a strong feeling now that um, my backyard, I have bees. Um, I have four active yards I had last last summer, and then I would uh, I would just catch the bees right next to my running beehive, like you know, I don't know, ten feet away. And so, but I mean, it makes sense. Um, last year I picked up. Um, I was lucky again, and somebody put an ad out like, "Oh, this beehive by the road. Somebody go pick it up." I said, "Yeah." Done. Got it. Because I need equipment, right? Uh, really well used, um, old, whatever, hive, some mediums. I, I already redesigned them and I built hide out, temporary hive out of them. But but uh, I bring it up and um, on my backyard and I have like a couple of nukes running here. And within a day or two, I have scouting going on. So, and I don't think these my nukes are scouting these things, right? <laughs> so anyway, it it seems as if if bees kind of aware of each other, and they kind of aware of what's going on in the vicinity or radius of a mile or two. I'm I'm sure they kind of they always checking each other out for a number of reasons. And so once you have active yard going on, it appears to me, and I I will continue to do it. Uh, you make sure you have a trap right next to your behinds, or maybe two. As a matter of fact, I would set like you know two or three because uh, one of them I would do it. I would set it basically right next to my active hives, and maybe set one I don't know a uh, hundred yards away. Also, uh, because it appears the um, uh, by literature I suppose um, and by bee talk that your swarm will probably try to go away rather than settle right next to the mother hive. But but somebody else's bees could be actually coming and checking out your hive by the smell of it, and they may land in a trap right next to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, anyway, I mean, that's kind of observation idea. Uh, people may argue, but I think that's a good way to do it. Uh, fall back, you have to have some bees, right? If you have no bees... Uh, that becomes more difficult. Um, but this past summer, I was also lucky in that way. Um, I was able to get some old used combs from somebody. I mean, we bartered. I gave him some bushes, and he gave me some um, old uh, combs, some honey for my nukes. I mean, it was a really, really good deal. I mean, I, I love to barter with people. <laughs> you know, I have bushes and stuff. I give stuff away, and people give me something. That's good. Um so, but once you get this going, and I also got some old 
old uh, boxes with some old friends from Joe, by the way. Uh, he gave me, because I was really hurting, and he gave me, like, a uh, good deal of frames and um, old boxes, and perfect for uh, traps and then perfect for um, just temporary hides, you know. And so I have all this old junk. What do I do with it? I just dump it into a big cardboard box, just crash it there. And then that's what I used to, 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 um, to um, I apply it to my traps now. Oh, yeah, and third point now, um, because this year um, I was actively splitting. Um, so, like, out of one, um, the hive that I was able to overwinter, I made four. I mean, you know, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, totally. So, it was one, I made four out of it. So, four was splits. And uh, it was outside of my swarm kitchen operation. So I, had, I had splits and I had swarms. <laughs> and um, so today, right now, Solomon, I have about 10 nook hives. And I think almost all of them are primed. Primed, I mean by this, I, I had bees in them. I kept swarms in them and I had splits in them because... Um, um, I found this guy on YouTube and, you know, there's many YouTube videos. I mean, you can, like, watch a whole day. But this guy, he made a really, really good point. He said, before I set any traps out, I keep busy in them. And so your trap becomes used equipment. So he said, I don't, I don't even set them out until I keep busy in them for, like, a season or something. But, you know. Uh, not in the season or not, but if you keep bees in this trap for a month or two, be it split, a nuke or whatever, temporary swarm, just so they build in it. And then kind of, you know, it gets fresh smell in it. It may be a good way to improve your chances for trapping. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, that's kind of my, for next season, these are my lessons learned. Because next season I will do the same again. Um um, because what I, I forgot I was trying to say. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah, well, I'm down to three hives. That's why. Um, that brings me to my next uh, next point. Um, unfortunately, and Joe, by the way, will confirm, uh, I mean, he's been trapping around here for years. Uh, as he was trying, He's trying to search for some feral bees. But basically now, where we at in our Dane County, Wisconsin here, um, feral bees are hard to find, especially in the Madison vicinity. I don't know why. Um, and basically, you catch swarms. Swarms are everywhere, by the way. I mean, you know, for sure. But they're mostly escapees. they commercial swarms. Mm -hmm. So, so in you, in, into a, um, a treatment-free model, it means that this swarm's probably gonna die, uh, and that's what happened to me. Basically, uh, my one-year survivor splits all of them dead, and um, all my uh, other swarms are cut. They're dead by now. The only surviving bees I have uh, are those splits that I made using queens from Nordak. Jeff um, Burns. Um, and so basically, um, I think I got his queens uh, mid July, maybe. Um, he had queens early available, and I got one in May, I think. Um, but see, I had, I only had one hive in May. So I had no resources. You know, I, I couldn't take in queens because I had nowhere to put them. Um, not much, but uh, by July, I had like, I don't know, six or seven hives going based on all this splitting and swarm catching. And so I had resources now. And so I said, you know, hey, Jeff, uh, he was like asking, uh, anybody needs to go in? I said, yes, here. So he sent me a few. Um, and so I get his queens. I go around my hives and I pull, you know, frame there, frame here. And I made like, I don't know. For each queen, I, I put together like two frame nuke, two or three frame, whatever. But my frames are big, by the way. I mean, as you know, so my frame is uh, equal to two mediums. Um, 
so anyway and um, so yes so by trapping for commercial swarms I was able to have resources so I have um, brood going I have um, some honey and nectar available I have young bees and so what do I do um, I'm finally I was finally able to take in queens from outside um, because I had resources thanks to all the commercial swarms I cut and so I, I knew commercials I mean you know they didn't have very good chances and sure enough I mean they didn't have chances some of them actually I lost one at end of uh, end of August September one already crashed beautiful strong swarm they just crashed and I didn't even catch them in time when I found out they were gone I mean uh, they already rubbed out too there's no, no honey left even it's just empty uh, I think those are my own bees robbed them but I don't know who knows and then um, in the course of in September two more crashed um, but by then I already had resources because I already had Nordic squints going thanks to all the resources I was able you know um, I had on hand so um, um, so I can say those commercial um, the bee swarms are great because they give you resource to get started uh, in the way you would like to start you know for example um, I was able to start um, with more resistant queens and so if I'm lucky uh, this way um, we have February now so uh, probably around March Feb about March I will know for sure that I still have three um, because they look good they're healthy and so just out of these three I should be able to propagate it to up to ten and you know and if I catch any swarms again well, then we'll go from there. <laughs> so, but how many swarm oh, yeah. traps are you planning on putting out this year? Um, um, oh yeah, so so yeah. Um, I think this year, last year, uh, I was um the kind of wide net fishing, if you will. So I wasn't really sure yet of any locations. Um, um. So just a couple of days ago, I released Jason Brown's uh, talk, and you know every time I listen to a show, maybe some of them I listen like four or five times by now. Um, I, mean, I mean, you know, really, I need to thank you, Solomon, for this podcast series. You know, some of them kind of like okay, I listen to once and I don't return to it anymore, but some of them I listen like five times because every time you listen over, you pick up a new point. Like ah, I finally get it now. So it's really important to listen to them over and over again. Mm -hmm. I would recommend that. Um, yes, listen to all of them as many times as you can. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, the the uh, the Jason Brands is a must. Leo Shrasky, one of my favorites. Uh, your expansion model, listen a few times. You have two or three. I don't remember. Um, Michael Bush's. I mean to listen again. Um, so yeah, some of those. Um, and I don't remember all the names. I need to almost go and back and review again. So so that's a plug, if you will, whatever. <laughs> but um, oh yeah, so how many? Um, I will put less. I put fewer traps, and here's why. Number one, I for sure. Uh, I will for sure. Um, I will have. I have four yards going again this year. I mean, by my backyard, plus three additionals. Um, people are asking to put bees, you know. It's like, can you put bees on my farm? I wish I could. I have no bees for you. But I can put a trap. <laughs> anyway, um, I will put about 10. But they're going to be, each of my yards gets at least two traps. Like I described earlier. Because number one, it takes less time. I already go to check my bees. Well, you know what? I have traps right there. And uh, so not, that's number one. That's how I'm going to be doing it. I will put fewer random tra um, traps because uh, we tried, Joe and I tried few locations randomly, and I put few of them just randomly around. Uh, there were no hits. But unfortunately, it took me a lot of time. I mean, you go there now and then, make sure there's nothing there. 
someone stole one of my traps, so that happens. So you try to kind of hide them, whatever, uh, or maybe location should be more or less secure. So I'll do a few random traps. I might do a couple or three. Um, but finally, I plan to have a lot of nukes this year in my, my traps. This thread on your, on your forum about trapping, and I think the pictures of my traps. So my traps kind of are set up to be everything. I use them as temporary hives, as traps, as transport boxes, as just frame holders. You know what I mean? Um, they. I want to be kind of... Uh, I like things that do many things. So... I'll be doing a lot of nukes. So each I have three hives, and out of each hive, I will make a split probably around May. So it'll take immediately three of my traps. And I plan, um, I read this website by Mel um, Dieselcorn. Is that right? Close enough. Close enough? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I read his, um, I read his um, literature uh, when I was on his website, and I like this. It finally, I understood the idea of of making late summer splits uh, for the purpose of creating um, nukes that um, will better survive to, to the winter. Um, and so, for that, I will need, need a lot of equipment. So I'm kind of so my trap slash nuke highs will gonna be used that way a little bit. I, I do plan to build more traps. I have uh, I picked up a couple of logs here, so I really want to build a log hives. So I'll use them as traps. Um, but you know, otherwise I don't have much time to build hives anymore because I need to build a couple of big permanent hives as well. I have new ideas here. Um, uh, it's true to talk about them yet. Um, if I you know, if I have a prototype and I'll, if I'm gonna build a hive, I'll probably put it out there someone for. So, but um, I'm going to focus less on uh, trap inside this year. I'll, I'll focus more on um, nukes and permanent hives and stuff like that. So, well, great. Well, we're coming to the end of our time here. Is there anything you want to get in before we close it down? Um. Well, yeah. You know, um, I meant to ask you a question or two, but let me ask you this. Um, sure. So, um. I mean, I don't know what, what, um, oops, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, my question was this to you. Um, Solomon, um, I know you, um, moved your hives, well, you moved yourself three or four times, whatever, Oregon to Arkansas, Colorado, back to, um, uh, which location do you think you were able to? Uh, actually establish good treatment-free bee population in your case. Was it Arkansas? I mean, I, I don't know exactly the whole the chronology, but I mean, can you tell about it a little bit? As far as, as far as where the treatment, well, hmm. as far as really, I came, I really came into my own in Arkansas. I really developed my methods and, and really got everything, um, to the point efficiency wise and production wise and quality wise that I wanted it. That all happened in Arkansas. I'm working at it again here in Oregon, but the difference is I'm realizing because the different conditions here in Oregon and having to basically start over with bees that aren't acclimated anymore. Um, it takes, it takes a different type of beekeeping here. And you know, that's what I, I keep telling people all beekeeping is local and, it seems like a lot of the time people just ignore that, but it really is functionally different in different places. Beekeeping is different. The practices mm -hmm. are different. The requirements are different. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I did that mostly in Arkansas, but I'm working on it again here, and so I'm learning what my, uh, you know, kind of learning how fast a, a nuke can build up and, and how many bees are needed to make a certain thing happen and uh timing especially is important to figure out you know like like this year you guys are having a pretty cold winter we're having pretty much lack of winter mm -hmm. um like you know right now is february is our coldest month and it 
pretty much every day for a couple of weeks now has been at least in the 50s, if not the 60s. Um, which is like March weather. So it's been totally different this year. We're already having, you know, the bees are bringing in pollen. Things are blooming already. This is totally out of the ordinary. So it, just having to learn different, having to kind of relearn how to do this. I mean, I, I can keep bees no problem, but making everything work well is something I'm having to relearn here. Um. What do you, I mean, don't you think it has to do with kind of um, overall bee population around you as well? For you, um, uh, what I'm getting at is, um, so I'm talking to Nordak uh, on and off because we have some plans for next year. Um, I would like to get some more queens from him of different lines. And it appears, and he's, on, uh, he's in Arkansas, it appears that he has some strong feral presence going in his location. I mean, he catches swarms, and unlike me, my, my swarms are commercials, he uh, is able to catch some ferals, uh, I guess. Um, and he is sure of that. And so, I mean, so far, and he's been treatment treat for like five years now. Um, so it seemed like this pocket of this resistance is present in his locality. So now with your case in Arkansas, it may be, I mean, do you think this was something else going on similar to what he has in his place? Uh, there was some kind of presence already, which was beneficial to you, by the way. I mean, what do you think of that? There were feral bees there, and there are feral bees here. Uh-huh. Um, I, it's it's hard to tell which is which sometimes. I mean, I know there's there's one spot where I where I trap that is completely isolated up on the side of a mountain. And I know that the bees in the area, there are no kept bees in the area. These are coming from, um, this, this, the lady who owns the property, you know, she has one hive in the corner of her house and two hives in her barns. And there's all these big oak trees around, which there has to be some hives here and there. And I've asked around and I've, I've found a couple of feral colonies myself and I've found, um, people have told me about feral colonies, so they're, they are around here, and of all the swarms that I caught this last year, I think I caught about nine, um, only one of them has died. Oh, wow. And everything's, and I know, I don't necessarily know that any of them were commercial or feral. I know that some of them were feral, um... And I have strong suspicions that some of them were commercial just based on the locations where I found them in the presence of local commercial hives. Um, but I can't, I can't pin it down. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. It is interesting. Um, um, because, um, uh, as I was listening to your podcast and I've been doing it like, I don't know, for a couple of years now, um, I, um, Initially, I mean, on early podcasts too, I mean, you, you spoke, um, and it was like, idea was, I mean, my idea was like, okay, it's simple, you just don't treat them, right? And then some might survive. Well, today I see that, well, I didn't treat any of my caught swarms, and they were basically commercials, and they all died. However, um, and I'm realizing, actually, as I kind of leave it myself. I mean, I'll leave the, <laughs> I'll leave it, this model of beekeeping. Uh, otherwise, it's not really interesting. I wouldn't even do it. I wouldn't even do it if I need to treat the bees. And it's like, honey is cheap, you know. I'll go buy some. But um, but challenge of it is interesting to me because um, I am an engineer by trade. I'm in IT. I solve problems. So... And I also a uh, kind of peasant. I grew on a farm, so all that kind of intersects interest um, in my mind. And so I like the challenge of it, and um, so it makes it kind of worth it to me. Now, but I do realize that it's not just about not treating the bees. It is part of the picture. But um, and I've been telling uh, people, and I think I, on some forum here too. Um, you know, it's about population. So if you have your bees, you just plug them 
into current population. And if you're lucky, the population benefits you. If you're not lucky, population kind of works against you. Like in my case here, um, pretty soon now I, I found out that uh, it seems like I need to just go ahead and just buy some feral queens um, from sources that seem to be doing okay, um, you know, um, because otherwise, I'm, I don't know, life is short. I'll, I'll spend, you know, 10 years trying to catch a feral bee here <laughs> and I may not catch any. Um, so... It makes sense to just kind of seek out people like yourself, Michael Bush. Um, but, you know, people on the treatment free forums actually have queens. Uh, it makes sense to just go ahead and just buy two or three or five of those. Uh, no need for any fancy naming, all these brands and stuff. I mean, regular people having bees, not treated, and they have, I mean, if they have queens available, they make it for excellent sources to just get those and try to establish your population on spot, you know. And so if in your conditions it feels like uh, the, the presence of packages is so high that it's kind of hard to push against it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a situation it feels to me like what we have here, so... Anyway, so, yeah, that's why I was trying to get your perspective, you know, how was it your, I mean, do you still have your Arkansas bees, by the way, with you? I mean, you, you brought some bees, right? And so yeah. they still present. I mean, you have population, right? Yeah, I brought them all with me. Mm -hmm. And so, and you have how many, I mean, how many of your Arkansas bees still around? They like five, ten hives? Uh, it's hard to say exactly because I haven't, I don't keep that detailed records, but. I brought seven with me from Colorado. Six of them survived the first winter. Mm -hmm. um, I've I've sp split off of them and made nukes, and some of them have died. And so you know, it's like it's like, what do you consider? Do you consider daughters of those the originals? If if that's the case, you know, probably half of my of my what do I, what do I have? Fifteen, eighteen hives now. Half of those are probably directly related to the bees that I brought from Arkansas and then Colorado. Uh -huh. um, and then the other half are swarms that I've caught here. So yeah, there's, they're still here. They've been, they've obviously been superseded a couple of times. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Since sure. Then. sure. Yeah. But okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see. I see. I, I got my answer. I mean, you know, you, so you do have lines going still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So yeah, yeah. I'm um one of my um the bigger goals is kind of to establish a variety of lines. So I have two lines which I got from from Jeff. Uh, the two distinct lines. And if I'm lucky, I'll preserve them this this summer. I'll, you know, propagate them. And then uh, if it works out, I might get more from him if I can. Uh, because I'm kind of like I might get some. Ask Joe, maybe he'll, he'll give me a queen or two. <laughs> we'll see what happens. So, but it's yeah, fun. if you can develop your own local feral treatment-free survival stuff, then um, populating your area, they will compete. They will out-compete the other stuff that's going on. And hopefully you'll be able to... I mean, you might be looking to catch feral swarms in the future, and they might be descended from bees that you had several years ago. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the queens I got from Nordic is kind of mean. Um, he and I we talk about it. We call it the Mad Queen. Um, so and last year they were kind of unproductive. I mean, I actually feed them. I, I have they have dry sugar right now. I, that, I had to kind of prop them up that way. But I mean, they surviving. You know, um, they just live in temporary plywood hive and like okay, fine. And uh, I don't even look for any honey from them next year. I mean, any forget the honey. But uh, my plan for them is I want to split them up uh, probably into three or four or five or however many I can um, and just keep them around. You know, I don't care if they make any honey. Mm -hmm. uh, just all I want from them, you know, no maintenance. I want to put you in a corner over there. You don't bother anybody. You just throw your drones out. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? And uh, that's all I need from them. Low maintenance. 
take care of yourself. Okay, if if they need to prop up and they need to be fed a little bit, I will. Uh, because if they resist the mic pressure, that's more important to me. Because honey wise, that's okay. I can spare a couple of frames from somebody else. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Uh, you know, but if they can do this way, sure. And uh, um, like you said, I, I like the idea of kind of building the population, just keeping it intact. So it's one way to do it. Like, you know, so if any bees even kind of like fussy that way, I don't really care. I put them there in the corner or like in remote yard to keep them away from people. For as long as they kind of take care of themselves, you know, good. That's all I need from them. So that's one way to manage your population, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, uh, so I've been learning from you people. <laughs> um, um, I have to commend you again on your podcast um, because I found many resources and many, many good ideas. Um, I, I commute by walking. So every day I walk about 30 minutes one way to my office. Um, and a lot of times when there's no new podcast, I'll just... Uh, Pull some old pad because to listen to it again. <laughs> now and then, you know, not every day, but mm-hmm. it's been a great um, thing to do when you commute. So I highly recommend that. Oh, I appreciate it. I wish I could produce more, but it's it's so hard to find guests. Oh well, well, uh, we so. need to. You know, we need to sign up some people. Um, I mean, hey, call Jeff. He could talk. Yes, I should call Jeff. Yes, I think so. Yep, I've got a few people. I've got a few. I mean, like with the case with you, like we were trying to schedule it for a couple of weeks, and you know, I've yeah. got other people that are, you know, kind of in waiting. So okay. it happens as it happens, and it's uh, my my creative process is maybe more organic than than some of those podcasts you'll get, which give you an episode every Monday morning or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, I, I, I understand. You know, everybody has job. I have job. You do whatever you do. You know, it's hard to coordinate. Mm-hmm. So, what are you gonna do? All right. Well, Greg, thanks a lot for being on the podcast. I really enjoyed uh, hearing you talk about your sideways frames. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, check it out. Think about it too. Um, and I'll uh, it'll be more work in progress. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, March comes. Uh, I can work in my garage again. It's kind of cold right now, so I don't care. <laughs> mm-hmm. But starting in March again, I'll start uh, cutting wood again. Do you have a any uh, a web page or a YouTube channel or anything I can direct people to? No, I don't. I uh, I keep thinking about it, um, but not not right now. I mean, one day I might. So, okay. but you know, I'll just kind of like direct people to your own. To your own f- um, the forum and uh, you know whatever. Yep. Your website. I read your website now and then. The forum is forum.tfbs.net, and Greg can be found there under the username Greg V. Yeah, I hang down there a little bit, and then on B source too. So. Mm-hmm. All right, well, Greg. Thanks a lot. Good to hear from you. Well, it was good to talk to you in person.
fun keeping bees? Because if you're not having fun, you shouldn't do anything. <laughs>